Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to a new episode of Ask Huda Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa al-aqibatu lil muttaqeen wa la adwana illa ala al-zalimeen wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidi al-awwalina wa al-akhirin nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd we praise due to Allah alone we praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let me remind you, brothers and sisters, with our phone numbers: uh, area code zero zero two zero two three eight triple five two four eight or two four nine, and the email address is ask at huda dot tv. We would not have uh, that many pending questions, but um, Amir from United Arab Emirates had two important questions. The first is pertaining uh, a gathering that they had and somebody said that we should not be paying wages to the muhafiz or the person who teaches their children the Quran and uh, they thought this is haram. Uh, the fatwa in this regard as adopted by the vast majority of the scholars Imam Malik was Shafi'i and some of the scholars of the Hanafi scholars, Hanafi school of thought, and similarly the school of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And, uh, and this is the fatwa which is adopted by the permanent committee of fatwa that it is permissible to pay salaries or wages to the muhafiz or the Quranic teachers because the Prophet said, and the hadith is a very profound and a sound hadith. He said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, إن أحق ما أخذتم عليه أجرا كتاب الله تعالى. The thing which is worthy most to receive wages for or upon is teaching the book of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Uh, there are other athar contradicting that, but this is a highly sound hadith, and it is like a cornerstone in this regard. Keep in mind there are very important advices in this regard that the teachers of the Quran and the shuyukh should not consider this a trade or a business where they bargain and if one is not capable to pay that much they refuse and so on. Second, they should consider this as a wage for their time. The money that they receive is not for teaching the Quran. Rather for the time that they imprison themselves when you go to somebody's house or when the children come to your place or in the masjid and you sit for four or five or six hours a day, uh, even if you have other business that is taken out of your time. So that's called Ajrul Habs. Similarly, the Imam who's leading the prayer in Ramadan, the original case is that one should seek only the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind teaching the religious knowledge, whether is it the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because no way that the word uh, of any person or his payment can be compared to the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala, since reading or teaching the Quran has the magnificent and the greatest reward. In the second hadith, which is narrated by Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهِ It is as general as it appears. خَيْرُكُمْ The best of all of you, the best of all of the Muslims, are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it to others. So if one hopes to receive the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for teaching the Qur'an to generations after generations, because this is a sadaqatul jariya, that is a continuous charity. And meanwhile, he takes what supports him financially so that he would not have to beg. Those who say that they should not be uh, taking any salaries, they have this concept in some communities. They believe that uh, the qaris, the hafiz, they should survive on halwa, on sweet. 
and, and that's it. It's not true. They should be living an honorable life, like everybody else, like doctors, like engineers, like professors. They're teaching the greatest knowledge, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as I say, remember, and this is a brotherly advice to those who are in charge of teaching the Qur'an, and every religious knowledge, it is not a bargain. It should not be bargaining as how much should you get, and if they do not meet your requirement, then you quit. In this case, that's a business. In the first degree, we consider this uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the biggest payment is from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah guide all of us what's best. We have several phone calls. The first is Salam alaikum, Umm Uthman from the KSA. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi I have two questions. Please go ahead. Uh, my first question is uh, regarding the lady uh, whose name is Maryam. She is in a big dilemma right now. She is actually the only daughter of uh, her mother. Her mother is uh, in uh, her early 90s, oh, sorry, early 70s. And she also has a husband. Maryam is married and she is a husband. Now she is confused about her duties towards her mother and her husband because she's the only daughter. And uh, her mother needs her all the time uh, because she's an old lady now. But her husband also wants her to be with her always, mm -hmm. with him always. Now, uh, the. Are you there? Okay, please try again. At least we got a part of the first question. I guess I understood what you meant. Inshallah, we'll answer that. And try once again, please. Brother Awal from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. They didn't have to tell me that you're from Nigeria. I figured that on my own. Yes. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay. Um, um, I have two questions for you. One is on behalf of my wife. She said I should pose it to you. Uh, it is regarding a woman, a pregnant woman who cannot fast during the Ramadan. Mm. So what is she to do? Is she to fast after Ramadan or to feed the Musakins? You didn't tell me the reason. Why couldn't she fast during Ramadan? Uh, due to the emphasis that is in her belly and that uh, she used to eat a lot. Okay, hold That's on one second. She, used to... she cannot uh, fast because she's used to eat a lot. A lot because of the baby in her so she is she pregnant is okay then the effective yes. the effective cause or the illa is that she is pregnant and she She's needs pregnant. to eat yes she needs nutritive uh, meals during the day and in order to uh, uh, support her baby as well okay so due to pregnancy yes due to pregnancy okay. and the second question is a reminder regarding the proverb that says, if Muhammad cannot go to the mountain, let the mountain come to Muhammad. What about it? Uh, is it? Is it permissible for a Muslim to, to I, offer such things? I answered that in details awal, uh, uh, during the last episode, and I got the origin of this phrase by an English writer. It has nothing to do with Islam, and we're not supposed to propagate it nor say it. It is... Um, uh, a tale was made up by a writer. So uh, it is not a statement that belongs to Islam, nor do they even rely on any reference to it. Uh, Non-Muslims uh, always say such statement even in America, but it does not mean anything in Islam. So I would not be repeating this statement again. Okay? Zakam. Uh, Sister Dina from Egypt, Salaamu Alaikum. How are you doing, Dr. Muhammad? Great, Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Alhamdulillah. I have four questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the first question is regarding the hadith, which indicates that wearing perfume for women is forbidden. Does it apply for both men and women? And wearing perfumes for women is forbidden, you mean general? I'm sorry? You mean general? All the time? The hadith in this regard is only forbidden for women to wear perfume, then go out. Yeah, that's what I mean. Exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the second question is regarding, I have noticed sometimes that in Juma prayer, that after we pray Juma, some ladies, they ask, uh, they ask to change position or spot from where they were praying with another uh, woman, so they could pray the sunnah. 
mean, is there a wisdom behind this? Can you repeat the question again, please? Yeah. Some, after we pray the Friday prayer, mm -hmm. prayer mm -hmm. some women, they ask to exchange spots where they were praying with the other, with the, someone who is praying behind them, so they could pray the Sunnah prayer. Okay. I mean, is there wisdom behind this? Okay. And my third question, what is the best way to give Dawa to the elders? Or the best approach to when you're giving Dawa to the elders? To the elders? Yeah. Okay. To the parents. Okay. And the last question is ruling on teddy bears. In the, like having teddy bears in the house, is, is this one of the things that prevent the angels from entering the house? Uh, may I request you to repeat the last question, please? Yeah, the ruling on teddy bears. Teddy bears. And having them in our house, does this prevent the angels from entering the house? From okay, us? is it being used as a toy for uh, babies, children, or adults? Uh, yeah, for children. For children, okay. Okay. Jazakum <laughs> Thank you, Dina. Sister Asia from the KSA, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, sister? Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for asking. Wa jazakallah. Uh, how, how are you and your family? Wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Shukran. Sheikh, I have two questions. Uh, yes, uh, first question is at the time of delivery, when the baby is, uh, I mean, the mother is uh, taking labor pain, uh, what uh, what, uh, what are the ayahs she should recite? What should she say? to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remember Allah Hussein what? And uh, question number two, uh, we can keep the name Humaira. Is it right to keep the name Humaira? Okay. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakum. Thank you, Sister Asia. Okay. S uh, Sister Umm Abdurrahman from the KSA. Then I will try to answer some of these questions first. Um Abdul Rahman. Go ahead, sister. Um, my question is about Zamzam. I had come back from Umrah about two weeks ago when we stayed at a hotel. Congratulations. We purchased uh, two large plastic jugs of Zamzam and we mm -hmm. brought it back home here. And I've been drinking it every day for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then I recently read that uh, somewhere on the, in, the, in the papers that there was a lot of fake Zamzam being sold here and there around Mecca. Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, if I had been drinking mixed or fake Zamzam for all this while, while uh, making intention for Shifa, would my intention still count? Would I still get Shifa even though I didn't know I was drinking? Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Amir also had another question, which is that they thought it would be recommended to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas uh, after eating on a regular basis. That is not true. And anything that is considered an act of worship, we have to ask for a reference. Has it been prescribed in the Quran or in the Sound Sunnah, indicated by any of the companions? No, it has no origin. Then we should not do it. Not only that, it may have an origin, but the way we do it, the routine in which we do it, if we differ than the original text, then that is considered an act of innovation or bid'ah. Similarly, nowadays while we are during the blessed month of Rajab, Rajab is one of the four sacred months, which is Muharram, Rajab, Dhul Qa'dah, and Dhul Hijjah. That is mentioned in the Quran, Minha Arbaatun Hurum, Fala Tazlimu Fihinna and Fusak. And these sacred months are superior to the rest of the months with regards to uh, the sacredness of the time we're supposed to avoid sins, we're supposed to increase doing the good deeds. But specifying a particular good deed on a particular time requires a reference or an evidence. I'm referring to when people plan to perform Umrah during the month of Rajab for a specific reason, it is better than any other time 
or it has a greater reward. There is no such thing. The time in which it was specified that if you perform Umrah, it will be uh, as great as performing Hajj, even with the Prophet ﷺ, is during Ramadan. فَإِنَّ عُمْرَةً فِي رَمَضَانِ تَعْدِلُ حَجَّةً معي. That is not for any other time. Second, fasting on a specific date or day, it requires a reference. We know that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And he recommended fasting on the three wide days, 13th, 14th, and 15th. And I reminded you last week with that. And alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, many of us observed fasting Thursday, uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Because it was 13th, 14th, and 15th of the month of Rajab. When somebody says that we should be fasting on the 27th because it is the miracle of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj and so on, I have to present the following fact. Number one, it is not proven that the miracle of the journey of Al-Mi'raj took place on the 27th of Rajab. So where did you come up with this date? It's mentioned in some books, but they always say that it is not confirmed. So we have to be careful with that. Who was the one who was blessed with the journey of Al-Isra traveling at night in a part of the night from Mecca to al uh, Bayt Al-Maqdis and led the prayer with all the prophets, that's Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the journey uh, extended to continue to uh, ascending to heaven. That was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Afterward, he never celebrated that date, nor any of his companions. If any person believes that he is smarter than the Prophet, or more righteous than the companions, because some people say, well, because the Prophet was the most pious, he never celebrated his own birthday, he never celebrated the birthday of his children, because he was humble. This uh, reasoning very common. They say, but if we truly love the Prophet Wasallam, we should honor him, and honor everything he used to do. But this is not true. This is not what you've been doing. If you have been doing the right thing or what you're preaching, then you would stick to what he ordered us to do. Then afterward, if you finish all the sunan, we can talk about it. But these guys, they barely practice the fard. And the sunnah has no room in their life. But they jump to invent things because that's called easy religion. Easy deal. They do what they like, whenever they like. On the 10th of Muharram, they cook the sweet and they call it Ashura. So we enjoy eating and drinking. Uh, in some cultures, during these occasions, if a couple are engaged, the fiancé has to buy for his fiancé uh, a gold gift, a ring or an earring or a necklace or whatever. The whole family is awaiting for this time. And that's why they consider, they adhere to these traditions as if it is a fard. And some families break the relationship, the engagement, if uh, the future groom does not fulfill that, they think this is a deen. It has nothing to do with the deen. There is no such celebration on these occasions. On the 10th of Muharram, Ashura, the Prophet ﷺ fasted, and he recommended fasting, and he said it wipes the sins of the past year for those who fast on the day because Allah saved Musa ﷺ and his followers. In Rajab, it's a sacred month, we should do good deeds as much as we can, and those who are regularly observing fasting on Mondays and Thursdays continue doing so. If constantly you're traveling to perform Umrah, thank you so much, may Allah bless you. But there is nothing called a particular Umrah during Rajab, or during Sha'ban, or we have to fast on the day of the 27th. And at night, my God, many communities, they make a big deal on that night and celebrations and particular food has to be cooked and uh, they recite poetry and have nothing to do with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. I know that it might not please many people what they hear right now, but this is a fact. The Prophet ﷺ said, follow and do not innovate. You see the difference between the, the, the two vocabulary? Follow and do not innovate. Even if you think this is cool, this is great, this is righteous. But the Prophet ﷺ neither did it nor recommended us to do it, then it will be rejected. 
من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد Go ahead and search all the records of the sunnah if you can fetch any proof that says that it is recommended or even permissible to celebrate that occasion bring it on perhaps we can join you but if you fail don't you ever don't you dare to say but my sheikh said so because your sheikh and my sheikh and every sheikh is supposed to follow the greatest sheikh the greatest messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam I have some people who say that but I have seen in a dream the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said you gotta do this in vain invalid doesn't work because if you have seen a dream I also saw dreams and everybody can come up with a dream or a ru'ya do you think that we can make a new religion based on dreams اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا today I have completed for you your religion and perfected my favor upon you and I'm pleased with Islam as your religion it was revealed during the farewell hajj and this is it. You cannot add anything to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it is in a form of celebration based on uh, mere thinking that it may be good. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. I hope that we benefit from this. Every year and every occasion we try to propagate the proper understanding, the proper deen. But it's up to you to follow or to innovate. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Amina from Nigeria. Amina, assalamu alaikum. I cannot hear you, I'm sorry. Okay. Asia, the Netherlands, assalamu alaikum. Question? Yeah, go ahead, please. Um, well, uh, the first question is when um, I uh, recite the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Al Hakim. Yeah. Um, that is it true that you that you will get wisdom of it when you recite it a lot of times? Like, uh, did they specify to you how many times? Like uh, more than hundred times or something. More than a hundred times. Okay. M or more than a hundred times. Okay. And and the the, uh, the second question is um, when uh, uh, a man is married to 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 woman. Uh, how should the two women uh, treat each other, even though when they are not really having a, a good relationship? Okay. Um, I'm going to answer the first question immediately, because it's still relating to the previous answer. Uh, the sister asked about the name of Allah al-Hakim, which means the most wise. If you recite it a certain number of times, and she said perhaps over a hundred times, that you will gain some wisdom and so on. Is there a reference to that? Let me give you the reference in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us to invoke him through his beautiful names. He said, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ To Allah the Almighty belong the beautiful names, the most beautiful names. So how shall we behave towards his beautiful names? How can we use them? فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا So invoke him through his beautiful names. What are these names? Some of these names are listed in the Quran. Al-Hakim, Al-Ghafoor, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Al-Afu, uh, etc. And some of them are mentioned in many sound hadith. There is one sound hadith in Al-Bukhari in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 beautiful names. Whoever knows them, memorizes them, understands their meaning, acts upon them, all of these synonymous are the meaning of man ahsaha. Whoever does so, dakhal al-jannah, shall enter paradise. It does not mean literally that all the names of Allah are limited to 99 names. But these are the names which we know. There are unlimited number of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he said in the hadith that you should invoke Allah through the following Allahumma inni as'aluk bikul ismin huwa laka sammayta bihi nafsak I ask you by every name that you named yourself with aw allamtahu ahadam min khalqik or you taught any of your creatures uh, to invoke you with 
أو استأث... أو أنزلته في كتابك or revealed it in your book أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك or you kept with you in the knowledge of the unseen so the names of Allah which we do not know uh, are beyond counting so there are 99 names if we know them if we learn their meaning if we invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take that person man ahsaha dakhal al to paradise what about specifying a certain name to be recited certain number of times for a pregnant woman to give birth for a person to pass a test for somebody who's in trouble to cross his trouble there is no reference to any of that including reciting his name al-hakim 100 times or 1000 times so what is the meaning of fadu'uhu biha is to choose the proper to choose the matching name for your dua during the occasion that you need that name most somebody who committed a sin and wants to repent he says oh Allah forgive me my sins amongst Allah's names is Al-Afu, Al-Ghafur, Al-Rahim, Al-Rahman, Al-Tawwab. These are all names pertaining, pardoning sins, forgiving sins, accepting repentance, having mercy. And there is also another name which says, Shadeed Al-Aqab, severe in torment. So would you say, oh Allah, you are severe in torment, forgive me my sins? I mean, it doesn't work out this way. So you would say, oh Allah, you are Al-Afu, the pardoning, Al-Ghafu, the forgiving. Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Ar-Rahim, forgive me, my sin. You see, this is how we we're supposed to use them. You know that amongst Allah's names is Al-Hakim, the most wise. You can say, Ya Hakim, make me wise. Grant me wisdom. Grant me wisdom through his name, Al-Hakim. As far as the number of times, if it is not indicated in a hadith, then no one on earth can say that you should be doing this certain number of times in order to get certain benefit. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. So reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas after eating is not indicated in the hadith. Rather, there are a hadith in which the Prophet taught us the etiquette of eating. Ya ghulam, sammillah, say bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim upon eating. وَكُلْ بِيَمِينِكْ Eat with your right hand. وَكُلْ مِمَّا لِيكْ Try to get the food from in front of you. Not from the middle of the plate where is the barakah. Especially if there is a congregation or a group of people eating from the same plate. So everybody should be eating from right in front of him. Not picking a choose, especially from the middle. Uh, upon eating, if you're visiting somebody, you invoke Allah via the following invocation. أَفْطَرَ عِنْدَكُمُ الصَّائِمُونَ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمْ مَلَائِكَةً أَفْطَرَ عِنْدَكُمُ الصَّائِمُونَ وَأَكَلَ طَعَامَكُمُ الْأَبْرَارِ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمْ مَلَائِكَةً and so on. You can also say Alhamdulillah الذي أطعمنا وسقانا. But reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas every time upon eating, I could not locate any reference to that. السلام عليكم. عثمان from Nigeria. السلام عليكم عثمان. السلام عليكم. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'm still, I'm still on. Okay. Uh, what was your question, Osman? So my question is goes like this. So my question is goes like this. What will be the position of somebody's marriage that he cannot sleep with his wife for several years, and he cannot, he do not ask his family to go to their family's house? What will be the position of their marriage in Islam? Okay, hold on, Osman. You're the one who called in the beginning of the program. No, 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 I'm just, the, I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm not, I'm, it's a different Usman. Okay, you're a different Usman, so start from yes. the beginning, please. Yes. No, no, no. Start over, if you can hear me. So I, I will start all over. Yes. Okay, my question is good like this. Somebody that cannot, he, he cannot sleep with his wife mm. for several years, what will be the position of his marriage in Islam? Okay. And, and you do not divorce his wife. Okay, now you're asking on behalf of the wife, not on behalf yes. of the husband. Yes. Because yes. if the husband doesn't have a problem, if she doesn't have a problem, then there is no problem. But if okay. she is affected and she has a problem with that, 
I will present the answer and I will tell you what she should be doing, inshallah. Okay? Okay. okay. The scholars said in this regard, if she is affected and she fears that this situation might make her go wrong, because a male and a female, both on equal basis, do have sexual needs. If these needs are not met and she's supposedly married, she has the right to file for a divorce if the husband does not give her a divorce. So if she goes to the Islamic court and she presents that case, the judge, according to the statement of the fuqaha, is supposed to give the man a chance. Some of the fuqaha, as I remember, Wallahu A'lam, Imam Abu Hanifa said that he's supposed to give him uh, a year because the year round contains four seasons. Sometimes the sexual uh, process and potency is affected by different seasons. Some people are moody, some people are having problems during uh, spring uh, allergy or whatever. This is the statement of the fuqaha. So by giving him the chance of four seasons, unless if this, per, uh, if this uh, problem is permanent, he's been living with that for so long, so the case also will be presented before the judge, and he would have the right to make what we call it fasqh, fasqh or a separation of the marriage contract, so that the husband would not have the power of revoking that fasqh, or calling her again into his marriage life, such as if he had divorced her, there is a hidda, waiting period. If it is after the first or the second divorce, he can recall her back. But in the case of the fasqh, it is irreversible. Unless if she agrees to marry him once again with a new marriage contract. A man who is in such condition and seeks remedy and uh, he was told that not a chance is supposed to give his wife the freedom of choice. No matter how much he loves her because now we're talking about her needs as well. You should not be selfish. If this woman is supposedly she's married, but she doesn't get a very essential part of the marriage life, then she has the right to ask for a separation, which would be called literally uh, a divorce in this case. And the man should be uh, understanding that is her right. Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'lam. In other cases, if the woman doesn't have a problem with that, then uh, you're fine. And everybody is happy with it, then that's a win-win game. Assalamu alaikum. Altaf from Oman. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, Altaf. How are you? Uh, alhamdulillah, Sheikh. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've been trying several times to get through, but alhamdulillah, I got an opportunity to ask a question from you. The pleasure is all mine. I have two Thank questions, Sheikh. Go ahead. But the first question is, I have heard of a hadith which says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, every misguidance, I mean, every innovation is a misguidance, and every misguidance uh, leads you to hellfire. Mm -hmm. uh, based on, on this, uh, uh, since uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa during uh, his time, did not pray more than 11 rakats in, in the month of Ramadan or otherwise tarawih, is it permissible to pray more than 11 rakats? Okay. That's my first question. And the second question, Sheikh, is that I, in, since I come from Sri Lanka, there is always this confusion during the month of Ramadan as to the commencement of the month of Ramadan, whether we are to follow uh, the announcement that is made in the Haram or in, in, in from Saudi Arabia, mm. or we are to wait till the moon is sighted in your in the country of uh, where you are resident. Jazakumma, mm. khair for your uh, advice, Sheikh. Thank you very much. Wa jazakum. Thank you so much. Barakallahu feek. Sister Mariam from Kuwait. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam, Mariam. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Go ahead. Sheikh, please. Only one question. Um, I'm Nigerian, but I live in Kuwait here. Hmm. And then I met somebody here. And then sent me to Hajj before we marry. Is it permissible? He sent you or he is planning to send you for Hajj? Yeah. Before we get married. So you're planning to get married? Yes. And he's going to perform Hajj with you? Yeah. No. He's, he's 
he has already performed it. So I am alone to influence. Okay, so you're asking about traveling to perform this Hajj alone. Go okay. Thank you, sister. Mariam, and uh, inshallah, we'll take a short break and we'll be back in a couple of minutes, so stay tuned. In your standpoint of view, are there specific or certain criteria to choose your spouse or your partner to marry or not to marry? Maybe that's the question. Do we revise the quality of performance of our treatment between the family members as fathers or mothers? As they say usually, it's not what you say, it's how would you say it. Wouldn't you like to be a good storyteller for your kids, neurobiologically speaking? Child abuse and emotional trauma causes scars in the brain of the child and this might be not easily hearing. What's the exact job description of a father? Is it clothing, payments, and feeding, or other important things? Well, I think the job description of a father is merely giving him love and care, self-confidence, giving him sense of security, and checking for the points of strength to strengthen them. What about potty training and its planning? Oh yeah, actually, it's a state, it's a condition. Fatherhood is not a body or a person, it's a state. Are you a good or skillful designer for the policy and the long-term plans of your, the life of your kids? Join us every Wednesday for Family Issues. Today, Arabic is considered as a very important, very significant language. How can we produce the sound, the state of voicing, place of articulation, the manner of articulation? So in Arabic, the words which are written are printed. We will learn how to write and pronounce Arabic letters correctly in depth. Explanation, fire board and presentation with many other important factors. And we have today more than 300 million people speak Arabic language. Not only in the Middle East, but you can find a lot of people speak Arabic language in Asia, Europe, North America, and in South America. What are you waiting for? Grab your notebook and pencil and stay tuned for Learn Arabic at Huda TV. Ark of Noah. We're going to be mentioning uh, the significance of uh, the Ark of Noah. Knowledge is the essence of everything. Once you get the knowledge, then it generates the desire and the motivation, and then it brings about the action. And we're going to be discussing the state of the Ummah, uh, and the division which uh, unfortunately has, uh, has appeared in it, and the methodology of trying to arrive at the right path. Your system of knowledge or your system of motivation are hit by any of these threats, you will definitely go astray and you will be suffering from a disease in the heart. We're also going to be discussing uh, what Allah wants from us. How can we make that? Allah gave us the revelation. So Allah SWT is addressing first and foremost the companions. If they believe in what you have believed in, then they are guided. So the real guidance is what the Prophet and the companions were upon. Join Sheikh Mutasim in the program Ark of Noah and discover the answers to these questions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We have uh, Umm Abdul Rahim on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, I told him I have one question. Actually, I have two. Okay. I want to ask you um, if you have somebody close who dies. And uh, if I, I read a hadith in this book by uh, Funeral Rites in Islam by Bilal Phillips. And it says that, you know, uh, do not cry for my brother after today. The Prophet was visiting the family of Jaza. And I wanted to know um, what if, you know, sometimes you remember the person and you cry. And is that you should ask. Um, Can you repeat the hadith again? It's um, 
when the Prophet um, he went to visit the family of Jaffa mm -hmm. after he, he died, and he said, uh, do not cry for my brother after today. Do, not, do not mourn his death. Okay. Do not cry, and the Arabic says, Tabku. Mm. And I wanted to know, um, even if you try to be patient, but sometimes you remember the person close to you. Okay. And, and, you, and you, you cry. Or, you know, even sometimes just when you want to make dua for them. Yes. It makes you cry. Is, should you ask, like, is that shaitan making you remember, or, or okay. is that something natural? And the other thing I want to ask is, it said that um, you, when the, on the Yom al Yama, you'll be raised during the last thing that you were doing. So what if someone was driving, but they were going to, like, distribute food for the poor, like Sadaqa and Ramadan and like this? How do they come up on the day of judgment? I mean, they'll come driving or... I don't understand that. Could you just explain that, please? Okay. Yes. Okay, we have uh, Mustafa from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa Wa alaikum salam wa Go ahead, Mustafa. Yes. My question is, what is the stand of a Muslim acting in drama or film? Acting in a drama? Yes, drama or film? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mustafa. Okay. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Awal from Nigeria uh, has several questions. The first is pertaining uh, a daughter. She is the only daughter to her mother who's 70 years old or in her 70s and she needs assistance. Uh, the daughter is married, she's living with her husband. He's asking about what are her duties towards the mother. Uh, the parents are the responsibility of the children if there are many of them. If there is only one, then the entire responsibility is laid upon that child, whether it's a male or a female. And the husband has to understand that, and he also has to understand that by helping his wife in taking care of her mother, he will be rewarded exactly as if he's taking care of his own uh, mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly ordered us in the Quran to be dutiful to one's parents, uh, and he normally begins the command by the tawheed or worshiping him alone, then he seconds that by the command of being dutiful to one's parents, such as in Surah An-Nisa, وَاعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا Then the second command is, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Surah Al-Isra, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And be good to your parents, be dutiful to your parents. So if she has any financial means, she is required to support her mother financially. If she is sick, she is supposed to look after her. Uh, if she is handicapped, then she is supposed to take her into her house if she has a room and if she has the capacity to do so. Otherwise, in case that the person himself does not have a room, does not have the financial means, then it is a responsibility of the state and that is the benefit of having an Islamic state to look after every person who is incapable or does not have the means whether he is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Uh, this is one of the virtues of having a, a Muslim state where no one will be neglected. Remember when Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu arda had to carry the sack of flour on his own back and bake the bread and cook for the orphans when he noticed that there are some orphans who did not have any food and he regretted and apologized and begged the woman uh, the mother of the orphans to pardon him and forgive him. Uh, but to the last breath in your life, you got to understand that your mother or your parents are your responsibility. If there are more than one child, they share the responsibility. Even if one of them is negligent, the rest have to take care of the parents or whoever is alive of them. The Prophet ﷺ said, may he lose in a dua, they said whom? He said one who witnesses the life of his parents or one of them and still cannot enter paradise through serving them. That is the meaning of the hadith and it is a part of hadith by the way. A woman who is pregnant 
and Ramadan is approaching, she cannot fast. It is known that uh, during pregnancy, uh, the woman has to drink uh, several liters of water a day and has to uh, eat and so on. Some pregnant women can tolerate that and can afford fasting and some cannot and that is uh, the general case. She is exempt. So, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ Those who can fast but with difficulty or hardship. فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ But if this woman, after she gives birth in the circling period of time, she is physically fit, then she must make up the number of days which she must. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the following verse that those who are sick or traveling, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخْرَ So we differentiate between two cases. Uh, sickness or pregnancy or breastfeeding, these are all temporary. Then the woman must make up the fasting after she recovers, after she comes back from the journey, or after she gives birth and she's able to fast, or she stops breastfeeding and she's able to fast. But if a person is chronically ill, people with renal failure have to drink a lot of water, people who are uh, in, in certain medical conditions, that they are diagnosed that this sickness is uh, chronic. They cannot fast, so in this case, it will be sufficient to pay instead the fidya, ta'amu miskin, feeding one miskin per each day that they did not get to fast during Ramadan. So if Ramadan happens to be 29 days, then 29 miskin. 30 days, 30 miskin, and so on. Uh, Sister Dina asked about wearing perfumes for women. She said there is a hadith. Yes, there is a sound hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, whoever of women wears perfume and she goes out of her house wearing that perfume and people find that fragrance or perfume, she is an adulteress. For he has any. And it's a sound hadith. Some people think this is too much and it's extreme. Look at it from the practical point of view. And when you look at it this way, that will answer her question when she said, is this the case for men? Uh, women are source of attraction versus men. If a man is wearing uh, sh shoes with the hard sole and making noise, there is no source of attraction for any woman. But when a woman is wearing high heels and making noise, this is a source of attraction. When a woman is wearing a perfume, if she goes anywhere, people follow that smell and the fragrance. So when she is wearing the perfume, the very attractive perfume with volatile fragrance, and they find the smell, then they look at it to find the source, and they see this woman, and they examine the details of the body. Then she is committing a sin in this regard. But at home, wear any kind of perfume you like. The most attractive, the most expensive, it's up to you. The Prophet ﷺ said, on the other hand, حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ مِن دُنْيَاكُمْ أَطْطِيبُ وَالنِّسَاءِ It is a commitment for men upon going to the masjid, upon going out to wear perfumes uh, and uh, or, uh, 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 fragrance oils. It is the sunnah. And the Prophet ﷺ said this is what he liked the most in ma uh, women to be taken in, uh, in marriage. So that does not apply to men because the effective cause of the prohibition is not available in the case of men. Uh, well, unfortunately, I was told that we ran out of time, and uh, we still have, uh, mashallah, a long list of questions, which inshallah, inshallah, if we live till next episode, I'll begin by answering them, and until then, brothers and sisters, I beg your pardon for not answering these questions, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us life, strength, and knowledge to cover them in the next episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A lies my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deeds.